Welcome everyone to Alberta Central and Alberta Credit Union's third speaker series panel, Setting Up a Side Hustle. Alberta Central is a central banking facility and trade association for Alberta's credit unions. And if this is your first time joining us, we are hosting these speaker sessions to bring together leading thinkers, forecasters, and innovators to help inspire bright and prosperous futures for Albertans. Alberta Central and our member credit unions have an unwavering commitment to the communities we serve, and we want to extend our community of subject matter experts to you to share their knowledge and insights on topics that are relevant and important to all of you listening today. My name is Alexandra Frizon. I'm the Director of Communications and Strategic Planning for Alberta Central, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator for today's event. So today our local experts will weigh in on the entrepreneurial landscape in Alberta and what it takes to launch a side hustle successfully. As an interesting point, there are some really big brands uh, that actually began as side, as, uh, side hustles and that includes Under Armour, uh, Groupon, Apple and Etsy. So I th thought that was really interesting when I was doing some uh, research. Uh, so today we're going to chat about the decision making behind starting a side hustle, the financial do's and don'ts, key skills, and the support systems that make it all possible. We're also going to discuss or touch upon briefly how to build a business plan that will set you on the path to success. Uh, we really want this to be an informative and engaging session, so please do feel free to interact by submitting your questions into the Q&A function. I will get to those, I will read them out loud, and, and we'll make sure that one of our experts has the opportunity to answer. Um, okay, so now let's get on to our panelists. We've got a great group with us today. They're going to be really interesting to chat with. So first and foremost, I'll introduce Zubin Duda an independent business advisor with Connect First Credit Union. Seeing entrepreneurs and small businesses reach their dreams and goals is really what Zubin considers his duty, as business analysis is his passion and his calling in life. He supports credit union members with advice tailored towards acquisitions and working capital solutions. He also helps members reach their full potential in terms of accessing capital to best suit their business needs. Next, I'd like to introduce Connor Curran, founder and chief laundry officer, I love that, of Alberta Business Local Laundry. Connor started Local Laundry back in 2015 after losing a fight with his washing machine. Oh, Connor, I am so interested in this. Ever since he's been on a mission to make everyone's laundry local. Now, years later, Local Laundry is all about Canadian made garments for social good. Having collaborated with organizations like the Calgary Flames, CBC, Shaw Communications, and many, many others, Local Laundry is on a mission to donate over a million dollars to local charities across Canada by 2030. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome our third and final panelist, Maria Jose. Maria is a digital content creator and blogger based in Calgary, who has turned her passion for creating engaging content on social media into a full-time job. So what began as a passion project during her first year in university has grown into an award-nominated platform allowing Maria to live out some of her professional dreams like covering the latest from Milan, Paris and New York Fashion Week runways. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, thank you, everybody for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here. Welcome. Uh, and we've got an hour. Uh, and that includes time for questions. So let's begin our discussion. Okay, so Alberta is home to many inspiring entrepreneurs and successful small business owners. And according to the Center for Innovation Studies, 19.6% of Albertans between the ages of 18 and 64 are actually involved in starting a business. This is the highest rate anywhere in Canada. So what is it about Albertans that make us so entrepreneurial minded? Connor, I'm gonna start with you. What's your perspective? Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. And what a fantastic question. I just can't wait to dive right into this one. I think it's right in our DNA. It's in our blood. I mean, if you couldn't tell from my ginger beard, my parents are from Ireland. And I take, if you ask 
majority of Albertans, whether it's their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, they all came from somewhere else. And they all came to Alberta for one specific reason, to start a life for themselves, to start a life for their families, to work hard. And that Alberta is a place where that really pays off. Alberta is a very special place there. If you put your head down and you go to work and you, you create something special, you will be rewarded. And it doesn't matter if you're a business owner, if you work for a company, if, if, if you're a tradesperson, whatever. You know, Alberta is a place where hard work and innovation is truly rewarded. It doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter what your last name is, where you went to school. None of that matters. Alberta is just a place where entrepreneurship is in our very blood and DNA. And the community, Alberta, fellow Albertans want to support that. When we see another person starting a small business, starting a cool project, being innovative, working hard, we want to support that. And we don't, it doesn't matter who they are, or if we know them, whatever. And we just, we recognize that and, and we really see that. So I, I think it's really in our blood and DNA that you go back far enough. Someone in your family came here to make a better life for themselves, to work hard and to do something different. So I, I, I think it's in our very blood and our DNA. And I'm so happy that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that you asked that question. So thank you. No, that's great, Connor. And I, I, I actually completely agree with you. I, I, I love how Albertans are, 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 are really hard workers and really care and the communities care about local business as well. So that's always nice to see. Maria, what about you? What is it about Albertans from your perspective that make us so entrepreneurial minded? That's a great question. Thank you for having me. Um, I agree absolutely with what Connor said. Um, my perspective comes from being a new grad and kind of like a younger entrepreneur entering onto the scene. So back in February of last year, I was actually applying for a stakeholders engagement position with uh, Travel Alberta. And as I was writing my cover letter, there was a CBC report that I came across and it said the fact that Alberta is one of the fastest growing provinces in the country, we actually have a very fast shrinking population of young people who don't believe that Alberta has enough economic opportunities for them, aside just from the oil and gas industry. And I've noticed that with a lot of my peers, kind of everybody was talking about leaving the province. Um, my experience as a young professional and a student at the time could not meet, could not be more of the opposite of that. Um, I was able to find professional opportunities as a creative entrepreneur by capitalizing on what I had around me. So the breathtaking landscape that we have around here is just, you know, a half an hour drive away from me. Um, and I also received a lot of mentorship within our thriving entrepreneurship community here in the city. So to answer the question, Alex, uh, Albertans are scrappy, kind of like what Connor said. Uh, we're a scrappy bunch and those who do stick around are focused on creating opportunities where at first glance, there might not be some. So um, I think that's what makes us very entrepreneurial minded. That's a great, that's a great answer, Maria. And you bring up a really good point. And in fact, was the topic of our first speaker series uh, was about uh, about uh, young Albertans and, and, and all the reasons basically to stay here in Alberta. So that was a great, great answer. Um, so as people are starting to maybe think about a side hustle, what are some of the top, let's say top three things that someone would need to determine uh, or answer uh, before they make that leap to, okay, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna start this side hustle. So Connor, I'll go back to you again. My biggest thing is always just, you don't need anything, just start. I mean, if you have an idea, if you wanna start a side hustle, there is no better time to start than now. And some, what I find is a lot of people, they get so hung up in creating the perfect business plan, making sure their product is perfect. You know, but there's never a good time to launch uh, a product. It's never a good time to launch a side hustle. It's never going to be perfect. And that's the secret. And that's the beauty of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be right. So I always tell people, I mean, you want to start a side hustle, go out and start it in the, 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 the minimal viable product, the MVP, right? For as cheap as you can, for as low as low effort as you can. I mean, it's, it's as simple as, you know, just going out and finding that first customer to see if there's a fit in the market, because if you wait for it to be perfect, 
it's it's you're never gonna launch and 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 what you might have in your idea in your head as a great idea and i think this is the best and everyone's telling me this is a good idea you don't know if it's a good idea until it hits the market and i'll and i'll tell you from my own experience when we first started I thought Calgary community t-shirts were the way to go. That was my big innovative idea. Inglewood shirts, Kensington shirts, 17th Thatchers. I thought this was great. And so I went and I started a print on demand website and lo and behold, nobody bought a single uh, community tee. And if I had a spent and spent six months building the perfect business plan, you know, went and met up with Zubin and got a business loan and, and invested $10,000 and, community t-shirts, I'd still be sitting on them. But because I was just able to utilize print on demand, I, I was able just to get going 48 hours from after I had the initial idea and I just started selling, you know, it, it, it turns out, yeah, yeah, it wasn't the community t-shirts. The YYC design that we came up, that people like that one and we started to invest more heavily in that. So my biggest thing is you, you don't need anything to get started. You just need to get started. <laughs> Right. And so, Maria, how, how do you feel about uh, about what you need to prepare, how you need to prepare in order to uh, get your side hustle going? Do you want to build on Connor's Connor's thoughts? Interesting point about uh, perfection, Connor. Yeah, absolutely. And perfection is so paralyzing, too. Right. So if you keep trying to make it, you know, the perfect T-shirt or the perfect photo or whatever it is you're just really are never gonna get there and it prevents you from learning from your mistakes like exactly what connor pointed out right um for me in terms of getting started was really determining what is it that i was going to talk about what type of visuals i was going to create and how i was going to be different from the rest so determining the pillars the themes what i was passionate about and how is how I'm going to be able to package those, those themes in a way that provides value to my audience. Um, and I think that kind of stems from my communication background as well. Um, I think also the same thing goes into creating a service or a product for someone. You're going to have to spend a lot of time creating and innovating and researching and being with that one thing that you're trying to offer. So making sure that you actually like it and believe in it and maybe not getting so attached to it in, in a way that you can mold it and pivot to make sure that you're actually catering to, you know, whoever your stakeholder is, is super important. So I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot, if I can summarize that, is uh, making sure you're also agile and you're flexible. Uh, and, and you can adapt quickly and not being hung up on that perfection. So I think those are all really, really valuable points. But all of that said, there are always some risks. So Zubin, I'm going to go over to you. So from a financial perspective, what are some of the financial risks that people should be aware of? So Zubin, I'm not sure you're on mute. Hi, uh, sorry about that. I was just trying to find the mute button on this. Um, yeah, so that that is a great question. Uh, in in terms of financial risks, you know, you can uh, go on Google and try to search, and there'll be a long list of you know everything from your interest rate risk and default risk and this and that. Um, but I I think for starting entrepreneurs, um, you know, there, there are going to be some uh, main uh, focus points. So one of them would be understand that your initial investment um, might go to waste. Um, you know, capitalism is brutal. Uh, it will chew you up and spit you out. Uh, so um, uh, I, I believe it's quite a well-known fact that a large number of startups uh, tend to fail, and I don't want to quote a percent because I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I I believe it's up from over ninety percent of startups fail. So just be aware that um, whatever money you do put in uh, to your company, um, uh, you you do stand a good chance of losing it, and and that's not um, you know something to discourage you, but it's it it is something at least to be aware of. Um, I think 
another risk that many uh, starting entrepreneurs may not realize, but will almost all fall victim to uh, is the lack of operating capital. Um, and again, this shouldn't discourage you from doing the business, but it should raise the question, uh, does your business generate enough cash flow in a timely manner to be able to sustain its self financial growth? Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, how do you plan on accessing capital uh, to fund that gap? Um, and the third one would be taking on too much debt. Uh, I, I think you know, a, a lot of people tend to believe that throwing money at a problem uh, will fix it. And I, I think in certain situations, it does. Uh, for example, for many businesses during COVID, where restrictions kind of curtail their uh, ability to generate revenue, I, I think it, it made sense for many businesses to um, obtain a loan, for example, uh, uh, just to stay afloat because their, their main business was intact and there's nothing wrong with the product or service, but they just needed to stay uh, afloat. So I, I think it's okay to take on more debt in that scenario. Um, but if uh, you, you really have to ask yourself, you know, um, does your business lack a competitive advantage? Uh, does it not differentiate itself uh, from the competitors? So, you know, is throwing more money at it a way of saving your business or just digging yourself into a deeper hole? Uh, and I, I think those would be the main points um, for uh, someone starting out. Okay, so with that then, how do you, or would you recommend, I guess, or how do you feel about somebody actually securing a business loan to get started? Or is it more appropriate for them to have some savings, Zubin, uh, that they can they can help use to fund the startup, the, the side hustle, or support them, you know, as maybe uh, as they're not getting too much income when they're starting up? What are your thoughts around that? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess that kind of touches on the first point with losing your initial investment. I, I think it's important to consider what stage you are in life. Um, so someone like myself, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly younger guy. I don't have any uh, dependents. And because of that, I, I think it's all right to, to risk a large portion of what you have. Um, and, and secondly, considering we're fairly young and we're starting off, the chances are the capital that we would lose uh, is not going to be impossible to recoup. Um, but then if, if you are a little bit older, uh, you have children, a family to take care of, I, I don't think it's wise to put all your eggs in one basket, have a safety net, maybe have different loans, a savings account, retirement, such and such. Um, uh, just to make sure that uh, when the market system punches you in the face, you have a soft landing at least. So, yeah, and and we touched upon business plans a little bit, and uh, you know, Connor, I appreciate what you what you said about just get going. Right, uh, I agree, but. For those who might be a little bit more structured and want and, and want to maybe create some sort of plan to guide them uh, and to help them, you know, figure out what's step number one, step number two. How do you feel, Zubin, from a you know a financial perspective? Is it appreciated if somebody does come in, uh, you know, to get a loan or get some financial advice? Are you looking for even just a very high-level business plan? Uh, to say to show you that you know they've thought about it and and they put uh, they put some you know thinking and structure behind their side hustle idea. Does it help to create something like that? Uh, so I think Connor had a good point in in saying you know you don't really need one to start off, and that's a hundred percent true. Um, the business plan could could act as um, as a feedback mechanism for yourself. So maybe doing one could help. But I think where a business plan really comes into play is when you're trying to seek financing. Uh, and, and that's because although you guys may be very inspirational people, highly motivated, highly driven, um, we're just bankers. <laughs> 
So we, we need something to understand, okay, what does your business do? Um, and I, I want to be able to understand all the ins and outs. Um, and and it, it also depends on the stage of business and the type of business, right? If, if you're coming to me because, you know, you, you want to buy a fourplex, then maybe I don't need a business plan. Uh, but if you have something unique, creative, and you're starting off, you know, chances are you don't have a long history of uh, financials. Um, and uh, so in, in that case of a scenario, to be able to help um, your banker or your lender or investor advocate for you, um, I, I think that's uh, uh, important to get the business plan. Okay, great. Uh, okay, let's get a little bit uh, into the stories of Connor and Maria, because I know, and this is a question that came in as well, it's, it's getting those ideas, right? How do you get these ideas to start a side hustle? There's so many of us who are interested in starting a side hustle or feel like it would be a really good, you know, something complimentary to what we do in our day to day. But then you sit down and you're like, how do I do this? What idea do I go forward with? So um, I want to make sure we answer that question, but I want to answer it through the sharing of your own experiences. So Connor, I'm really interested in your story. Tell us about your journey. Tell us about how Local Laundry came to be. Where did you come up with this idea? Yeah, definitely would love to. So I grew up here in Calgary did everything you were supposed to do, everything you were supposed to do. I went to university, got good grades, senior class president, you name it. And everyone says, what are you going to do afterwards? So get a big job at a corporation, make lots of money, be lots of super successful, business suits all day, golf on Fridays. It's going to be amazing. So I came home, got a job, big corporation, and I hated it. Holy man, did I hate it. There was no passion, no inspiration, nowhere to be found. Everyone was just kind of going through the motions. It was very kind of flat, just like that day in and day out. I was just not for me. So I then one day, my boss's boss walks in and he's like, Connor, can I come talk to you? And I go, absolutely. So excited to see you. I got lots of ideas. He says, Connor, thank you so much for uh, your two years here. But, uh, you know, times are tough. We need to lay you off. And I just like smacked to the face, punched to the gut, did not know what to do because here was a place that I wasn't really happy with. But all of a sudden, some guy from, I never met, my boss's boss come in and he had so much control over my life and just see it never, you know, and that really kind of struck a chord with me. And I just kind of thought, you know what, I don't want, you know, again, I was kind of in that position, no dependence, no mortgage, no kids. I was okay, but I looked to my right and I looked to my left and I saw, saw these people whose lives and their family's lives were instantly upended. And that really struck a nerve with me. And so I kind of said, you know, I, this can't be for me. I have to try and do something different. And so I looked to my parents for inspiration, you know, and I briefly touched upon them. They came here when they first got married, they were 18, 19, no education. You know, they came, they both worked three jobs. They made a life for themselves. They opened up what all good new Canadians do. They opened up a restaurant from back home. They own and operate a fantastic Irish pub here in town. And, and I really looked at them for inspiration and said, you know what, I think I'm going to become an entrepreneur. So I packed up my bags. I moved to Sweden of all places. And I started to do my master's there. It was there that I was like, I really want to be an entrepreneur. I really want to start my own business. And so we lived in this tiny little Swedish house and we had this tiny little Swedish washing machine. And this was a devil. Every time we did a load of laundry, it was the bane of our existence. And this thing would dance all across our little tiny Swedish house. And after one night of battling this thing, pretty spectacular and losing, I, I just kind of sat there and thought, you know, everyone wants to support local businesses. Everyone wants to support local food, craft beer, but nobody, nobody really wants to support local clothing. Why isn't our clothing local? Why can't our clothing be local? And I started to do some research. You know, all you got to look no further than a great resource, Stats Canada, and just pile through there. I, I found prior to 1989, over 70% of all clothing bought and sold here in Canada was made here in Canada. Now, the last bit of data they have was from 2015. That same stat, that same number, less than 5% of all clothing bought and sold here in Canada is made here in Canada. So I really kind of went down this rabbit hole um, 
you know, how can we make laundry local? How can we use clothing as a way to represent our values, express our, our, our core beliefs and, and, and how we're perceived and to the world and how we can bring people together. So I just did what anyone does. I Google searched how to make a t-shirt company. And then I watched a YouTube video and I found a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step guide. And within 48 hours of this kooky idea, I had an online t-shirt company. I was selling clothes from Sweden to Calgary you know and uh it just i was just sparked with curiosity so i think to kind of answer your question where do these ideas come from how do you know what's a good idea or what i think you just have to be open to the idea you have to you have to be open to inspiration you have to set your intention what is it that i want to do what is it that i enjoy doing kind of zubin's point about that initial investment and you kind of have to see it as just you know it could could be gone i like everyone else the early 2010s i try to build a, an app I'm no developer, I'm no programmer. I spent thousands of dollars trying to build an app. That was a terrible idea. But what that taught me was that, okay, uh, that was a great education. I saw that as an investment, as, as part of my education. And I figured out what I'm not good at in a space that I don't wanna operate in. Tech is maybe a little too outside my realm. But t-shirts, even though I don't know anything about it, I don't know anything about fashion or e-commerce, that's something that's a little bit more comfortable that I can get hands on, that I can dive in, sink my teeth into and really learn. So as long as you set yourself open for that inspiration, set that intention, but also have the curiosity and the drive to pursue that, pursue those intentions and those ideas relentlessly, you'll be, you'll be just fine. Excellent. And, and, and from that, Connor, from that experience of being in Sweden and, you know, Googling, I love that you said that because we all Google it's so relatable, right? It wasn't some rocket science, you know, PhD paper that you read, you just Googled it, which is, which is excellent. How did it, how did you go from there? So you started and within a couple of days, you had this online t-shirt uh, business launched, then what? Then I just focused on selling one shirt. I did everything I could just to sell one shirt because I just wanted to see if this, if was I crazy, was I cuckoo or was this an actual thing? So I did everything I could. I got on every social media platform. I got on, you know, uh, the, the other social media platforms. I got on Reddit and I posted it in my story and all this. And you know what people thought? I got lamb base. People laughed at uh, my, my shirts. They laughed at my designs. They laughed at these Calgary community tees. And my wife, when she was so upset, she goes, Connor, these people are so mean to you. I said, no, are you kidding me? This is amazing feedback. Maybe these Calgary community tees aren't a good idea at all, but some people seem to like this YYC design. Let's follow this path. And it, so I just, it was a journey just to see if I could sell one shirt. The one that I could sell one shirt, let's see if I can sell two shirts and so on and so forth. And it got to the point where I moved back from Sweden. I finished my master's and we were starting to sell a couple of shirts a week. And then I met my business partner and then stores started to approach us. And it's just because I put all my focus, all my time and my energy into this because it was so much fun and so rewarding. I guarantee you there's no feeling out there. Like when you take nothing and you take it, nothing else and you put it together, and you make something, and then some stranger out there believes in that something that you've created out of nothing, so much so that they put their hard-earned money together, and they, they actually go and, and buy on your website for one reason or another. This, I, I got addicted to this feeling. You know, the little cha-ching sound on your, your Shopify app, even though it's only one shirt a week, one shirt every other week, and it just, it really, maybe it was just a rush of endorphins just come to my head. It just maybe want to pursue more and more and, and get to know these people. And why did you buy a shirt? What did you like about it? You know, what do you not like? What can we be doing better? And just to get a little bit better as a company, step by step by step. And now fast forward, you know, we're, we're a, a small but mighty team. We're four people, but, you know, we we're you know, making, you know, a million plus in revenue every year. We're growing We're we have a goal. We want to be able to donate a million dollars to social, uh, to local charities by 2030, you know, and it all just started how to make a t-shirt company. You know, we, there's no better time to start a business because we have the technology. We have the resources. There's no excuse. You just need to make the time, not find the time, make the time. That's such, such excellent advice. And I really liked what you said, Connor, about taking the negative feedback and actually 
uh, appreciating it and being open to it because it's still feedback, right? And at the end of the day, those kinds of comments can still help you fine tune your product, right? So I think that's really, really good advice. Uh, what's one thing, Connor, about your business uh, that has surprised you uh, that you actually didn't foresee coming? Yeah, great, great question. The number one thing, it hit us pretty hard. Started looking at all these customer names and a lot of female names. And uh, which shocked us because here I got three sisters. I have a beautiful wife, but I know nothing about women or women's fashion or any of that. But the majority of women were, were buying our garments and we weren't selling women's clothing. We were selling unisex garments. And and that really kind of surprised me. I just thought, you know, we'll sell T-shirts. I imagine 50 percent men, 50 percent women, you know, that kind of thing. But when you start to dive into it, OK. 7% of our customers are women. So how do we reach that customer base? How do we talk to that? So we, we hired a, um, you know, a team member, a marketer who can, who speaks the same language, you know, that's fits in that core demographic. You know, we start to, to dive further and further in that. And people ask us, you know, well, are you going to come out with women's clothes? It's, we would say no, because another big advocate that we started to see was people from the LGBTQ plus community. You know, people were coming to us because they saw that our clothes didn't have labels on them. You know, that they weren't identified as men or women's clothes. They were just clothes, you know? So we kind of took this notion that, well, all people need clothes. So why don't we make clothes for all people instead of just simply putting labels on this is a man's shirt, this is a woman's shirt and nothing in between. So those were kind of things that you kind of go along and you're not doing this intentionally, but all of a sudden, you know, 70% of your customers are women, but how do you, what do you do with that information then? So it's about being, being organic and being flexible and being able to adapt and, and to meet your customers where they need, right? So if, if 70% are, are women or members from the LGBTQ plus community, you know, how do you cater to that demographic? And if you don't identify as part of that, that community, find someone that does and, and, and um, you know, just meet your customers where you're at, where they're at. I think that that's excellent and, and it really speaks to, you know, knowing your customer base, right? And, and making sure that you're, you're paying attention. So I, I think that's, that's excellent. Um, Maria, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on to you now. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you started as a content creator and, and a blogger? You touched yeah. a little bit on it, but if you could just build on it a little bit more. Absolutely. So about five years ago, um, I completely changed gears from being a pharmacy assistant um, and enrolled in the PR program at MRU. Um, very similar to Connor's stories, a story in a way that I was in that pharmacy world and it just not suit me by any means. Like <laughs> I come from a half African background and with our you know, community, there's only three things you could be an engineer or in the medical industry, or I don't know, like an architect or something. So I ended up going into pharmacy, it did not suit me at all. I was very unhappy with the position. Um, so then at the time I ended up changing and pivoting into a new career. Um, while I was in school, I actively kind of submerged myself in pursuing works and projects that spoke to me. So most of my assignments were geared towards topics on sustainable fashion, store openings, diversity and inclusion, community engagement, and other things that I just kind of really gravitated towards. Um, so while I was in school, I filled my spare time with creating and posting content on Instagram mainly. My partner, John, and I would go out to the mountains and basically just shoot. Um, when I started, I heavily relied on the imagery of our surroundings. Um, so one thing that really kind of generated that engagement is people would see me chasing these like four tier waterfalls with 10 pounds of clothing on my back. Um, and just kind of going on these tracks. So I was originally going, I was a fashion content creator, but it's funny because people started reaching out to me about like advice on trekking <laughs> and, uh, you know, what is the best way to like get to the waterfall that I was shooting at. Um, and then on the flip side, um, I was actively applying the strategic storytelling concepts that I was learning in the classroom towards creating messages for a real audience online. Um, 
Fast forward to kind of, I believe it was second year, my best friend kind of cornered me and said, let's go to France. So <laughs> I'm someone who really jumps at opportunities like that without even blinking. I said, yes. So on January 1st of 2019, we were in France. My main goal while being on this um, study abroad, you know, semester was to maybe make a connection somewhere in the fashion world because at that time Instagram was kind of just almost like a hobby it wasn't anything that I was generating full-time income or even part-time income but I knew with the communication background I wanted to be in fashion and beauty my mom was a designer back home she created garments for you know women in governments and now she owns a very successful alteration business here in Calgary so fashion and design is kind of in in the blood so when I was in France, a uh, TV personality in Calgary got invited to attend a fashion week show. Um, he wasn't able to attend, so he referred me to the PR agency and said that, you know, there's a, a brilliant content creator from Calgary. If uh, this is the kind of audience you want to reach, she has a great engaging audience. So he texted me and, he's, and he said, Maria, do you want to go to fashion week? And I was like, how is that even a question? Of course, it ended up being a way bigger deal than I thought it would be. So um, it was a English designer. I was invited to go into the, um, the dressing room and kind of pick an outfit. It was a $3,000 gown. We were at the Ritz Carlton um, that was the show uh the show was at the ritz carlton and there were big big names i think like celine dion was there and it was just the amount of publicity and exposure was insane and then as connor mentioned calgary really loves to support their people so when when everybody back home was seeing this kind of like you know very glamorous side of content creation and fashion and everything that i was doing my engagement skyrocketed and I started amassing even more of a local audience, even though I was in France. Um, then we go into my second to last semester of my public relations degree, COVID hit. At the time I had sec I secured a communication internship with Globefest. Um, it was a mandatory internship. So if I lost it, I couldn't graduate. So two months after I signed the letter of agreement to actually go on board, I got contacted by the heads of comms and they told me that I lost the internship. So that was super devastating. I think a lot of, you know, young people at the time, a lot of my peers had lost, you know, their internships as well. Um, it was devastating. I cried for 24 hours and then I hit the ground running and made a proposal to my uh, university to be the first kind of ever entrepreneurship um, branch within like our communication degree um, through my content creation business. So I pitched the idea to my program's chair and then um, to the career advising services department. They were very receptive and together we worked on um, outlining requirements that I would actually meet, you know, through my business and it, or in order to graduate. So, um, and that fit into the curriculum, sorry. So one of those included a mentorship program with Brookline PR and the girls there took me in um, and they guided me throughout the four months. I've learned tons of incredible skills. One of them is how to effectively communicate and cater to brands. Um, and I basically created this self, uh, you know, started internship and I was able to fully dive into my side hustle at the time and see if I can support myself with with it being a full-time thing. Um, I'm now graduated and it is my full-time gig so it obviously panned out um, and we're here today. <laughs> That's, that's such a great story, Marie, and I'm hearing, uh, you know, something similar from you that I heard from Connor as well, which I hope, you know, everyone else is hearing as well, and it's really to, you know, make lemons or lemonade out of lemon, right, and and taking advantage of, 
you know, something that might seem negative, right? You didn't get into to your internship, you know, you lost that. But again, you you create an opportunity from that. And I know Connor did the same. So I think that's such a great uh, message for everybody to take with them is don't let the obstacles, you know, knock you down, get back up and keep going. Um, with that, we're running out of time. So just a couple other questions. And I know that there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, common mistakes. Are there any common mistakes that you see others making when they try to launch a side hustle? And I'll just let uh, I'll let anybody respond. Zubin, you jump in as well. You know, from your from your perspective, what is what is a common mistake that some might make? Yeah. So from from my perspective as a lender, at least, uh, if if you're trying to seek uh, any capital, you know, things that I notice first thing is people tend to be really optimistic on their projections uh, and, and that can set you up for a failure because, you know, for example, if you're accounting for a million dollars worth of sales, um, you are probably also projecting uh, a certain amount of expenses in relation to that. And if you fall short um, off your revenue projections, then that can put you in the hole and, and, uh, um, hurt the further growth of the business. Um, also, I would recommend everyone uh, to keep track of all your expenses and your purchases um, uh, because that's also gonna come in handy uh, uh, from a lending perspective because we're gonna be able to understand the economics of the business. Uh, it's, it's okay to say that you made 100 grand or 20 grand or 50 grand um, but that doesn't give me the full picture, uh, and I, I need to understand the entire thing and the economics of the business to be able to uh, um, uh, determine how we can help you. And I think the third, a third one is, is, is a little bit more of a psychological tendency that people have, which is doubt avoidance. Um, people tend to reach a conclusion and reach that conclusion rather quickly. Uh, and, and, and so because of that, they don't take a multidisciplinary ap approach when looking at the problems. Um, so I think just down your thought process, um, uh, think, thinking through your business plan uh, and, and that will help foresee many problems in the future, so. Great, thank you. Connor or Maria, is there any any mistakes that you might see people making that you want to offer insight into? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'd love to build off what Zubin was kind of saying because that's everything he mentioned is is the number one mistakes I see all the time. Right, we're all like he mentioned, motivated, driven. We're as you can tell, we're very excitable people. We have this amazing idea, and this amazing idea is going to be the greatest thing ever. What we aren't good at is getting down to the brass taxes, the numbers, the financials, because that's not fun. Zuba, don't bum us down with, with cash flow analysis and forecasting. That's not sexy. Uh, we didn't get into that. Guy. But that's what you need to know. Cash flow is the lifeblood of your business, right? And the people that fail are the people that don't understand, right? That, that, that get in that mindset of just, oh, yes, this, we're going to do this. We're going to do loads. You know, um, and that's why my big thing is in, in just like getting started and, and um, you know, Lee in the chats, just, you know, $100 startup, startup as a book, like great, great book. Start for as little as money as, as you can. Do pre-sale, right? Don't make anything till you sold it so that you know what the market's going to be like. And then when you, it's time to come for a loan, instead of saying, oh, Zubin, I'm going to do this money. You can say, hey, Zubin, look how much I got in pre-sales. I got a million dollars in pre-sales. I got a million dollars in orders. Can you lend us some money? Of course he's going to say yes. So that's 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 the cash flow and knowing the financials and nothing crazy, just the basics and keeping track of the numbers. That's the number one mistake. The number two mistake, um, and maybe a piece of advice as well. So for me, I'm not good at numbers. So uh, my business partner is very good at numbers. He's an ex-banker himself. Uh, him and Zubin would be best friends because they speak the same language. And so where I'm not good at, he's good at. So find a business partner if, if you're not good at something that that matches you, that can um, complement you, right, in terms of skill set and what you're 
good at and what you're not good at. But when you find that business partnership, because the, the second thing that always happens, and the reason why a lot of businesses fail is failed partnerships. You can have a fantastic business, a fantastic market, your financials are great, but for one reason or another, the partnership fails. You have to work on that partnership as you would a marriage, right? Because that's that's what you are. And the hardest part about a partnership is setting the ego aside. Right. And making sure you have the same thing, because because oftentimes you go, oh, we don't I don't want to do that. No, that's my idea is better than that. Your idea. Stupid. My idea is better. No, my idea is better. No, I want to do this because this is my vision. When your visions are aligned, what you want for the business and out of the business are aligned and you can strip egos away, you're going to have a successful partnership and you're going to have a successful business. So if highly it's entrepreneurship can be a very lonely lonely journey highly recommend you get a partner early someone that you trust don't get a friend a stranger is actually much better as a partner someone that you can trust and someone that uh you have the same shared vision that's a relationship that you work on as hard as much as you do as a marriage so know your financials and work on your relationship with your partner as someone who actually runs a business with their partner (laughs) connor i hear you loud and clear Um, John and I had to, I think for a first year to year and a half, really figure out our parameters and who is responsible for what and not not let our relationship get in the middle of the actual business itself. So I 100% agree with that. Um, And another thing to add in terms of um, maybe not so much mistakes, but skills that are required is um, having strong verbal and communication skills from like Zubin said, you know, you don't have to have a full on uh, business plan, but it, to be able to articulately communicate what is it that you're trying to do is worth its weight in gold. So I uh, might be a little biased because of my communication background, but I think that goes a long way. No, I think that's great, everybody. Thank you so much. I know we're at our time and I feel like there are so many questions I didn't ask and I could talk about this for another hour. It was such a great session and we really, really uh, at Alberta Central and Credit Unions of Alberta really appreciate all of you joining us today. Thank you. It sounds like you're really busy, so we appreciate you taking the time. I did wanna let all the participants know that we will be emailing a link to this recording. So if you wanna go back, you wanna hear answers again, uh, and you really wanna dissect what the panelists had to offer, uh, you'll get a link, it'll be emailed out to you. And uh, also just to let you know that we have a couple more of these sessions coming down the pipe. We have one in November that's focused on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's gonna be a pretty stellar panel as well. And then of course, we. We have one just in time for Christmas shopping season in December that's around cyber security and and keeping yourself uh, safe online as you're starting to make a lot of purchases. I know I'll be doing that. Um, but anyhow, thank you so much again, uh, Connor, Zubin and Maria. Thanks to all of you who joined us today and really hope you got some good information and go out. Don't wait. Start those side hustles and and don't look for perfection and take that leap. That's the message I got. So I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll look into that. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. See you. Bye bye.